Marie Forleo, and you are watching Marie TV, the place to be if you want a business and life you love. And today, we are going to be interviewing an amazing author, multiple New York Times bestselling author, Brendan Bouchard. And he's got a new book out called The Charge Activating the 10 Human Drives That Make You Feel Alive. Amazing book. It's really a cure for many of us if we feel restless and stressed out and just really like we don't have the energy and the drive for life, the enthusiasm for life that we know we could have. So let's talk to the author and let's learn a few things about how we can activate our natural human drives. Cool. Hey everybody, it is Marie Forleo and you just saw me dancing with his book and I'm going to show it to you again. This is called The Charge. I am so honored today to have the incredible author, uh, Brendan Bouchard. Thank you so much for being with us on Marie TV. Hey Marie, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Love all your stuff. Uh, love all your stuff. So we've been on a little bit of a crash course for a while. I have so many people in my audience that just adore your work. They adore uh, The Millionaire Messenger and I'm recommending that book all the time. But today we're going to talk about your new book, which is called yeah. The Charge. And I know it's your fourth book. So many people in the audience, this is a little bit of an aside, you know, have dreams of writing just their first book and you're on your fourth. Does it feel, is that a little surreal or? It is. Yeah. It is. Well, it's, it's happened over the last four books in eight years. So it's, it's been a period of time in which it's happened. Yeah. Uh, but the last two were the ones that really took off and both of those happened like so fast. I mean, two New York Times bestsellers in the last two years. Mm. And so super fast, super surprising, but I tell you fun. I love it. It's, it is, as we'll talk about today, it's, it's an act of creative expression, which is what really drives us anyway. Yeah. And you know, one of the things I want to uh, mention, right, what you said there is so key. You wrote two books, but the second two were the ones that took off. Yeah. And I think for many people, or whether they're starting a business or again, they're writing a book, if they do something their first time out of the gate, if it's not a blockbuster, sometimes they can get down on themselves rather than looking at the long term or the long term game or, hey, this is just the beginning of my journey. Did, right. you, um, did you experience any of that disappointment with your first book? No, you know, because I always know, you know, the, the journey to quote unquote success, you know, it's different than what most people think it is because especially when they change genres or industries or jobs, they expect to start at the same level they were at. So, right, you, you, let's say for me, I was a consultant before I started doing all of this. Yep. In corporate America, I built change management and leadership programs. Well, I spent seven years doing that and I achieved this level of success. And then when I came into the writing and the speaking and the teaching world, I wanted to start there. Right. But I knew, I said, no, 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 actually, I'm gonna start here again. But well, here's the difference is that first time that might take seven to 10 years to build something significant and kick some butt. Yep. The second time when you start to doing something, that learning curve and that growth curve is going to be shorter because all the knowledge, skills, and abilities you developed over here, they're going to come over here. So the key is that we always have to remind ourselves like, hey, you know what? Let's take a little edge off. Maybe it took seven to 10 years here. Now this one, it might take two, three, four, five. But it'll be faster because I have all that experience and that knowledge and that passion now. And I'm just more worldly. So it will happen. But we have to give ourselves time to climb the second mountain. You yeah. know, we, you climb that first mountain. If you're going to go climb something new, you got to realize you got to come down the first one and build yourself up. So I've been, you know, all my life I've been a person hopefully who's present. And in, if you have a lot of presence, you're also willing to be pretty patient, you know. I heard your little iPhone. I was like, oh, was that my iPhone or your iPhone? Yeah, sure. Sorry about that. No, just, don't worry. Please, don't worry. My iPhone's always going off. And I see, I don't know if you see my face frozen like it was before. It just did. It just you said did? That. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll let me freeze. And I'm sure if we have the audio, which I can hear the audio on my end, we're just going to keep rocking and rolling. Okay. So I love what you shared about um, the whole mountain idea and, you know, taking your skills and your abilities and your experience from one arena and knowing that they are going to transfer over. And just that idea of having patience. And I think also being in it for the long term. I yeah. think one of the things that some people can get caught up and one of the things that may actually have people feel less charged in their life, which we'll, you know, we'll get into the charge in a moment, but is those unrealistic expectations, right? Of instant success or overnight right. fame or all of that stuff where you have to really have that vision of, you know, why are you doing this in the first place? And I, one of the things I admire so much about you, Brendan, is it's so clear how devoted you are to serving. 
-hmm. and making a difference. And you can feel that in every video that I've ever watched from you and the words that you put on the page. And I think that for all of us, it's really important to remember whether we're writing a book or starting a business or going on any journey in our life, creating a great relationship that we love. You got to look at the long term and what do you really want out of this? You know, like, why are you really doing this? Yeah, it's key. And, and I think a lot of, I mean, everyone who's watching this or, you know, listening to this knows for sure that, you know, they've, they've got passions and they've got dreams. And I always say it's fine to be unrealistic in your expectations for things as long as you're also giving yourself time to complete them. You know, it's like no one would ever think that you and I could be doing what we're doing right now. Right. But we had, we did have a set of that, an, an unrealistic desire, a hunger and a passion and drive in us. I mean, ambition is always unrealistic. Yes. Because ambition requires us to look beyond where we're at today. Yep. And ambition should be unrealistic. It should allow us to stretch and grow and challenge ourselves. The difference is, are you willing to love yourself along that process? Are you willing to give yourself a, a break when you fall? Are you willing yourself willing to know that there's a reason that you're doing all of this insanity and keep reminding yourself of those things? And, and are you willing to, along the way, not get frustrated, but keep your, your, your mental, you know, sort of, I call it your conscious dashboard, yep. clean and clear and directed. And if you can do that, then the journey is going to be fantastic. I love that. I love that. I love what you shared. And, uh, you know, the unrealistic am- ambition, um, I found that to be true always. Like some of my biggest dreams, they even sometimes scare myself, but that's what makes it exciting to that's go right. after. That's right. Yeah, the drive for challenge, right? And without, without that, what are we doing every day? We're waking up and we're browsing on the internet, right. you know? It's, it's like you become very undirected if you don't have ambitious drives, if you don't have the things that are not only, it's like most people, they feel like they, they feel like they have to sometimes like push themselves out of bed mm-hmm. and they have to push each day. And it's a struggle because they don't have anything that's pulling them. Mm-hmm. And when you have that bigger desire, that bigger dream, that bigger challenge, and if that thing is compelling to you and you love it, it's, it's going to pull you forward. And so it's important to get connected to that and excited about that. And that thing will always seem unrealistic. It was unrealistic for us to go to the moon, but Kennedy said it anyway. Right. But it did take to the end of the decade to do it. Right. So he, he understood that. And I think we all have to give ourselves a little bit of breathing room right now because a lot of people are being so hard on themselves right now mm-hmm. because of the economy and where they might be at in their business or where they're starting. And if you're down on yourself, you're never going to be able to pick your business up. <laughs> Love that. That could be a tweetable. We might have that be a tweetable. <laughs> so, um, so what motivated you to write The Charge? Again, which is an amazing book, and everyone watching this right now, you guys need to get it. We'll tell you where to do that below. Um, but what motivated you to write um, this particular book? You know, the, the, the journey began for me 16 years ago. So it, it, a lot of people see it as a short-term thing with my books, but it began 16 years ago. As you know, I was in a, in a pretty dramatic car accident. Yes. And it taught me, you know, at the end of our life, we're going to ask three basic questions. And those questions are going to be, did I live, as in, did I live my life vibrantly and fully? And we'll ask, did I love? Did I love openly and honestly and completely? And did I matter? Did I make a difference? And I knew those were the questions that we're going to ask at the end. So I wanted to live my life so that I was really living and loving and mattering. And, but like anyone else, you know, I just, I get blocked some days. It's like, no, I didn't really live my life today. I kind of, you know, bowed out, you know, or I didn't really love today because I was scared because I got hurt one time or I didn't make a difference because I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And so I started getting really serious in the areas of psychology, neuroscience, and high performance studies. And so it's been 16 years reading a book a week in one of those areas. So I did a lot of research. I've always just been fascinated. Like, what is it that drives us? Right. And then last year, I lost my own charge. Um, last year I was in another accident. Uh, apparently I shouldn't leave the country because both <laughs> I think Denise, my wife is going to pull away my passport at some point. But, uh, I, you know, I, I left the country. I was in an ATV accident and I got a brain injury and it really rattled my life. Um, I got, I had long story short, I had post concussive syndrome where I was having a lot of trouble, um, because damage to the, my prefrontal left cortex, my cerebellum, my hippocampus. I was having a lot of trouble with like executive control and seeing what I was supposed to be doing. I was having a lot of trouble um, with my attention span and connecting with other people. My memory was down. My ability to make judgments was down. And it took about eight months to really overcome that concussion. And in that process, I had to learn, like I felt so bad 
I had to figure out how do I activate things that will make me feel alive. And I think a lot of people can relate because there's always something in our lives that feels like, for me, it was an injury. Yep. For other people, it's the, the status of their life mm-hmm. or the, the state of their business. And they get really trapped down. And at some point, we have to say, okay, this is an external reality. Maybe I can't fully control it. But what is it that I could find in my life or create, more importantly, what could I generate in my life that would make me feel alive despite all this? And what's fascinating about this, Marie, I think as you read in the book, is that if you, in my situation, if you injure your brain, Mm -hmm. they tell you to use your mind to fix it. Interesting. Yeah, the neuroscientist says, oh, wow, your prefrontal cortex is firing really low. That's why you can't really see the future. You're not being able to have a good attention span, make good decisions, and connect with other people. So that part of the brain, we know how to activate that. Mm -hmm. So think of these types of things. Challenge your mind in these types of ways. Do these types of experiences that will light that part up. Because as we light it up and it fires up, the neurons reconnect or they re-strengthen. And it's like rehab for your brain, but you use your mind and your life experiences to do that. And I had so much fun rebuilding my brain, literally, that I thought everyone needs to know about this. Like these 10 human drives, if we activate them and we're strategic about it and we're consistent about it, we can feel more alive than we've ever felt. And that's not just, you know, self-help hype. Mm -hmm. That's brain science. Like we can actually see those parts of your brain coming back to life again. We can release the parts of the hormones in your body like like dopamine, vasopressin, oxytocin in a way that you feel alive and alert and engaged and connected with other people at levels most people have never experienced. But all of that we can self-generate by the way we use our mind and live our experiences. Uh, and that's one of the things I love about the book is your focus. And I know you, uh, just as a person, love to focus on neuroscience and the research and you read so much. And that's why I think this book is, is so important. And one of the things I love about it, too, is how actionable you make all of the drives. You know, at the end of each chapter, it's like they're simple questions that, you know, you kind of prompt us to answer. And I'm like, God, I love these because it's making my brain think in new ways and they're simple actions to take. So out of the 10 drives, we know that there's five baseline drives and then mm. five forward moving drives. I'm curious just to know from you personally, is there one drive that you either find the most, I don't want to say challenging in a bad way, but one that you find that you have to bring more attention or consciousness to, or one that mm. just find, do you find challenges you the most? Yeah, um, that's, that's a good one. Um, for me, at this point in my life, and it's yeah. funny because I think they change, and oh, hi, you're back. Yay! Um, <laughs> um, so to give context, can I give context to these? Yeah, right oh, of course. Drives are, um, yeah. for, your, for your viewers. So the baseline human drives are the drives in our lives that really, they're the baseline. They're the ones we have to hit to feel fully driven and alive. And, and these are the ones that are usually based around self-knowledge and social belonging. So there are things like our ability and our drive to have control in our life and competence and congruence in who we are. But then there are also the drives for us to connect with other people. So our drives for caring and connection. And those really make us know ourselves and connect with other people. And then the forward drives where all the bang for the buck is, which is will frame my answer, yep. is the, the forward drives are the ones that really, they're, they're the great amplification. They're the home runs in terms of making us feel more fully alive and expressed. So these are the drives that are really about self-actualization and social contribution. Instead of social belonging, now it's about contributing. Mm-hmm. And so the forward drives are things like change and challenge and our drive for creative expression and contributions and our higher drives for consciousness and reaching another state of living and being. And so for me, right now, the one that I'm, I'm working on and, and every, you know, every one of these chapters breaks down, as you said, each of these drives and says, here's the three things you can do. For me, that's on creative expression right now um, because I think that today, uh, the better that we are at creatively expressing ourselves, we just feel more fully alive because that's our unique voice being shared in the world. And most people, even I realized this, even when I was writing the book, Marie, that there's parts of my life that I'm not fully creatively expressed in. Like mm-hmm. you walk into my office and it's like, well, it's like, who designed this office? Is this really Brendan's office? Right. I've been in a lot of people's houses. When you look around the houses, there's no fingerprints of them around the house. You know, it's not, you know, it doesn't scream their space. Yeah. And so for me right now, I'm creating spaces both in my real life and spaces online that really, I think, represent me more fully. Uh-huh. And it's in that challenge, challenge is one of the other drives, the challenge of more creatively expressing ourselves. For some people, creative expression is really just teaching them to 
to use their voice again, you know, to share with the world what, I mean, what are your ambitions and your dreams and your hopes and your desires? What is it you're trying to do? Are you sharing that enough with people? And if you're not expressing that, then the, the world can't hear that call. Right. And so for some people, a creative expression isn't just how you decorate your house or what you wear today. It's how, how consistent are you in truly expressing who you are and your desires to the world? And the more that you are able to do that, the more you do feel more engaged with the world and certainly the more the world engages with you. I love it. You know, one of the things that we've been doing, and I know I'm probably frozen right now, and that's really okay because as long as you guys can hear me, y'all see me every week, so you don't need to see my mug moving all the time. Um, one of the things we've been doing in my house and with my friends is like last night we had a dinner party and we had some friends over, and I always try and come up with a fun question, you know, uh, and asking them, you know, what are they creating, you know, or what uh. do they feel is holding them back, or, you know, what's we talked about, like, what's the one thing you're so embarrassed about that you wouldn't want anyone else to know? And it's, so, it's <laughs> things like that where you find people rather than just you know talking about um, Hollywood gossip or you know latest movies you start to really dig deep inside and connect more and become more vulnerable and create mm -hmm. deeper relationships so I love hearing that for you I think creative um, expression it's one of the things that I'm doing in my life as well we're looking around where I live I'm both um, out here in Sag Harbor which is where I'm semi recording this from because again you're seeing me with a silly <laughs> look on my face which is totally fine and in New York where we're like remodeling and renovating and doing some things so our space feels more creative and it mm -hmm. allows for more creation to happen, building a studio, building all kinds of things like that. So I, I love hearing that from you. Yeah. And people, you know, I think out of all the funny thing about all the four drives, this would be the one that people don't give enough weight to hmm. because they're like, oh no, because the other drives are so compelling, right? Yeah. The drive for change and, and the book teaches people, well, if you're not changing, it's because of these three reasons. If you are scared of change, it's because of these three reasons. And it talks about challenge and this big drive to go out and, and connect to our ambitions and challenge ourselves every single day to be bolder and be the best of who we are, but also set real strong intentions for where we're going. Uh, the drive for contribution of giving and the drive for consciousness of better mastering our own mind and our being to reach our highest levels of self. All of those things are really compelling. Creative expression, people are like, ah, but here's what I tell people. Right now in this economy, mm -hmm. creative expression is currency. Yes. That's like the people who are poo-pooing it are like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, that, this is soft up. I'm like, no, no, no. Today, creative expression is the economy. It's the generation of content. It's the generating of unique ideas that is driving the economy. And, you know, you read uh, Richard Florida's work, a uh, great book called The Creative Class, um, or Dan Pink's book called A Whole New Mind. And both of those detail this turn that we've had in the economy by facts that illustrate, in, indeed, we've come to a time and place in which the right brain and activating the right brain will be the secret and the differentiator in all of the working world. And so, some people say, well, yeah, yeah. And, and as you can see in, in, the, in the book, there's some people who I'm coaching in the book who really needed to reactivate the right brain again to feel more alive and more expressed and more successful. And so that chapter is a critical turning point, I think, for a lot of people in the book. Yeah, it's, it's huge. And I love just to tag off of what you just said there. You know, um, Seth Godin has an amazing book called Lynchpin. And mm. one of my favorite quotes from that book is about how now more than ever, what he calls artists are being paid more than in any time in history. And that word artist, he uses it in such a context where people bring that level of creativity to their work. And you know, something right. you and I were talking about just you know before we started recording, we were having fun, is just how much enjoyment um, for me, I'm particularly getting out of bringing a sense of design to the world of personal development and business advice and how we can use our creativity and really channel it through our businesses. I think it's so exciting and it can be such a differentiating point that really sets you apart and sets you apart yeah. not in a way that puts anyone else down, but really just creates this beautiful mecca of kind of what you're talking about, like your own fingerprint, you know, that's yeah, really... If, if, if your work is miserable, yeah. then creative expression is not there. Yes. That, that's, it's one of the easiest ones when I coach people. I'm like, and they share with me, you know, well, I'm unhappy here. It's like, boom, I know we put creative expression back in there and they're more fully engaged. We just have to teach them about how to manage projects even differently in their lives so that they can be in, quote unquote, more creative control or, you know, beginning, just the, just the act of seeing a, 
a, um, a project from beginning to end is a needle mover for most people. Can I and, tell you, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. When I yeah. read that in your book, I realized uh, the people on my team, like some of the folks, because um, my team has grown dramatically over the past year and it's been amazing. And I realized one of the differentiating points and you highlighted in the book was seeing a project from beginning, middle to end. And I saw two different projects, one where uh, a key creative person on my team had to come in in the middle and she was less satisfied. She was she was frustrated, not at me or at us as a company, but I couldn't articulate it and she couldn't fully articulate it. But then when she came in on a project where it's like right from the beginning, we all brainstormed, you know what I mean? And she saw it through to completion. And when I read that chapter in your book, I was like, OMG, this is huge. It was it's so huge. awesome. That, you know what's funny? That's the number one part about the book that companies have been asking me to come and speak to them about. That, it's, that one, it's like, what, two pages, two, yeah, three pages? Yeah. But it's just a game change in how we think about it because we all got trapped into thinking, oh, you know, having all these teams and these outsourced teams and, and, you know, having me master one skill and hand it off to everybody else, that's the most efficient way to work. It is, and it's the less fulfilling. Yes. And so it's like we've got to, you know, part of the reasons when I work with a major team to help them kind of figure out what's going on with them, I'll just say, hey, look, I, I see you in sense here that no one is really satisfied with this because they haven't had their hands on it. Yeah. I mean, no artist wants to come in when the, 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 the painting is half done. Yes. You know, and so we've got to teach each other to give our own paintings and finish our projects. And, you know, I know you and I are both right now talking to a lot of entrepreneurs, and I can tell you, entrepreneurs, one of the reasons you're not absolutely satisfied with your business and where it is at a success level a huge part of that comes from you're not completing the projects you know you need to complete. Amen. You've got, you know, you got a bunch of low hanging, uh, low hanging fruit. Yep. These projects that could be completed if you just sat down and gave it another day, another two days, and you worked it, and you blocked off time, and you protected your time, and you just did that, you'd crush it. But right now, what people do is they've got five or six or seven open projects that are never going to be complete or yep. be close to being complete, and that creates misery in our lives because there's a part of us the human drive for control and the human drive for congruence, those two combining in a way that says, hey, this is something that's on your plate. Yep. It's not done. You said you were going to do it. Why not? Yep. And we have this internal conflict now that makes us miserable in our business. And so I tell people all the time, one of the reasons to master your productivity is not just so that you get stuff done. It's so you actually get the benefit of feeling fulfilled and satisfied again. Yes. And so let me ask you this because you're amazing at getting things done and you crank out so much incredible work that changes so many millions of lives. Um, let me just ask you a little bit in the inside of, of Brendan. Or is your work style to go, um, you know, block out a bunch of time and just go hard and get it done versus chipping away at something over a long period of time? Do you get those? Um, depends on the project. Okay. The more important the project, the bigger the project, the more I'll block time for that. Cool. Um, that's definitely a big piece of it. But the chipping, if I am chipping, yep. chipping happens for me in months. Mm. So meaning if I'm chipping away at something, it will be done in 30 days. Right. There's no question. A lot of people have been chipping <laughs> for, for years or two. I'm chipping away at that book. I go, you're never going to write the book. Right. Because right. there's just certain things you like block time is the most important thing we teach at High Performance Academy. This idea of when and where to block segments of time to get things done. And it sounds so basic. Yep. But I, I, when I, we and I can stroll in anyone's life and look at how it's organized. And if there's no block time for a creative expression or creating the things that drives commerce for them, yep. whether products or programs or new services, that's why they're not advancing as much. They're just not blocking the time. They're getting stuck in, you know, I call it browser blackout. <laughs> so they open the browser and like four hours later, they're like, they, they got fed a roofie or something. They're looking around. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I always uh, something we talk about in B school. If it's not scheduled, it's not real. It's like yeah. something we drive in, where it's like, dude, if you're going to talk about it, it needs time in your calendar. It needs a chunk of time. It needs to be respected. And just like little mantras like that, just knowing if it's not scheduled, it's not real. You know, it can really change someone's game. You know, one of the things that I remember uh, from my days dancing and doing a lot with Nike is uh, I discovered how I like to work best. And mm -hmm. we used to have like three or four days where we would create choreography, then we would train the choreography, meaning um, we would teach it to ourselves, we teach it to others, and then we would record it and create these training DVDs that would then go out to hundreds of Nike athletes around the world. And what I loved about that time was just like, I loved waking up early, you know, and digging in and knowing that within four to five, you know, sometimes six days, we would knock it all out. 
And there was such that level of satisfaction where, yes, was I exhausted? My body was tired. Yes, I was sore. But the deep level of satisfaction knowing we created something excellent, we shipped it so it's out the door. And then there was like a little, you know, level of rest, a couple days of just chilling out before we go into that next kind of high intensity mode. It's one of the ways Uh I like to work. Yeah. 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 It's it's a huge part. And I mean, it's another thing. And we're trying to give a lot of tips here in in this thing here. And for entrepreneurs, it's, it's to realize is that, you know, if, if someone's in a place where they're not succeeding at the level they really want, it rarely has to do is are they smart, are they, are they competent, are they capable. It rarely has to do with are there resources around for them to leverage or could they network better. It, it, that isn't a, it comes out of distraction. Yeah. And because their energies are distracted in so many different ways that aren't being complete and in so many useless things that they end up losing literally millions of dollars. We did the study at High Performance Academy where – we, we, we found out the average American watches four hours of television a day, okay? Four hours of television a day. Well, over the adult lifespan, that ends up being 13 years Oof. in front of the TV, Oof. nonstop, 24-7, 24-7, oh. nonstop for over a decade of your life. Oh, okay? my God. If, if that is horrifying, check this out. You take that same amount of time, and we say a person's worth, uh, you know, a person's salary could be 20 bucks an hour. And you, you uh, uh, pull that through their lifespan as well, over those 13 years. That was a million dollars in lost salary. A million. If you invested that at like a tiny percentage, three, five percent, that ends up being over two million dollars of lost opportunity, four hours in front of the TV. But here's the deal. Everyone goes, well, I don't, I don't watch four hours of television a day. It's like, yeah, but I bet you're distracted four hours a day yes. unless you're managing your life really well. And so a lot of people, th- that distraction of four hours a day, whether it's distraction because of browser blackout or they, get, they don't know how to use their inbox or, you know, and notice I said they don't know how to use their inbox because the inbox is a tool to be used. It's, it's my favorite saying of, of all my stuff is in the High Performance Academy, which is, uh, and in the book, The Charge, too, he said this, too, is, is, you know, the inbox is nothing but a convenient organizing system for other people's agendas. Yes. Oh, I love that line. One oh, when you get that and oh. you just, like, my inbox, I totally know. My inbox is other people's stuff. So I manage my day, but by the time I hit my inbox, I know exactly who I need to reach out to. Yep. I know exactly who I'm waiting a decision for. And if, so when I open up, I look, have I heard from these people? Nope. Send an email to them. Reach out to these people, boom, send it out to these people, close. I'm done with the inbox until it's time to come back and do it later on in the day. Yep. And the rest of the day, block time, creating things. And that's how, you know, we've just, I mean, a very humbling statement from a, someone in our industry recently who said that we've created, that my brand, we've created more content and more training programs with more hours of training in the last five years than almost anyone in the industry in their entire career. Oof. And I would put that up against anyone. I'm like, yeah, four books in that amount of time. But more importantly, you know, we've got five brands that do a million dollar plus. Yep. Built those in five years. There's not many in, in different genres. Yep. There's not a lot of people who could do that. And I don't do it to brag. I do it to go, the only reason I've been able to do that is by removing distraction and getting more strategic about the day. Yep. Which I love. I absolutely love. And in fact, that brings us perfectly to uh, one of my other favorite parts of the book, which is on page 226. A little curiosity. That's why you have to go get the book so you can know 226. It's the chapter about the drive for consciousness. And Mm -hmm. you talk about a really powerful question that we can all ask ourselves, which is, where shall I focus my thoughts right now? And I Mm -hmm. love the distinction there. You said how it's way more powerful than asking yourself, what am I currently focusing on and thinking about? And I wanted you to talk maybe a little bit about the distinction between self-awareness and self-direction because I feel like this book, The Charge, is really about giving us the tools to be self-directed and to take control of our lives. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you picked up on that because, I mean, that's obviously that's that's a huge theme of being – part of the reason people don't feel fully charged and alive and fulfilled in their life is because they've – in so many ways, they've checked out. Yeah. And they're letting life happen to them, and they are not directing it anymore. And when we're not in direction of our life, we do feel a sense of misery over a period of time. You can't avoid it. Yeah. And so that what will really charge is self-direction. The difference here is, you know, what happened, especially in our personal development industry, um, we started taking a lot from psychology, and which is great. And I study psychology, as you know, like like crazy. Yeah. Um, and I'm. I'm I, I'm very passionate about that work. If I wasn't doing what I was doing, I'd be a therapist. 
And yet therapy is a very different thing than what we have to advise people to advance their life in our genre. So the difference is in therapy, one of the question, main question is, you know, the therapist will say, what I want you to do is I want you to focus on what is it, what thoughts are coming to your mind throughout the day and being very attentive to what those thoughts are and where they're coming from and why they're coming from this place and whether or not those are supporting you or not. And that's really great self-awareness. But a lot of people in our culture right now, are they're stuck at self-awareness. Yes. Like, they're fully aware of the crap that's... I hate when people say, oh, Brennan, everyone's zombies and they're checked out and they're unconscious. No, no, no. Like, people, if you talk to them, they're very conscious of what their problems are, what their challenges are, where their frustrations are. People are very conscious of what's going on in their lives and they're not happy about it. They're self-aware, but they're stuck there. And so I say, look, there's a better quality of question, which is instead of, well, what am I feeling, which is sort of at a, it's almost at a victim level question. Yep. There, so I hate that I just said that, but it, it kind of is like, well, what am I feeling? Because naturally these feelings are just boiling up or what am I thinking? Because these thoughts are just hitting me on the head and that's how I feel. And I go, no, no, no. Look, here's a better, more empowering question. What shall I be thinking right now? What shall I be focused on? What shall I be feeling if I was backstage and I focused on what I was feeling at my events, mm -hmm. then that would never serve the audience because half the time at my events, I mean, I've been speaking for four days, standing up for 12 hours a day. Right. I had any breaks. Right. I, my physical body might be saying, man, I'm, I'm really feeling, I'm tired, but I have to say, no, what should I be feeling right now in order to serve? Yep. If you're going to go in and, and talk to your kid about math, you can't be like, oh, what am I feeling right now? We have to be more directive and say, you know what, what, what do I need to feel? What shall I feel right now? What shall I be thinking about so that in this situation I can serve my child? And this is, this is a quality of life that says, it comes from this metaphor. It's my favorite thing to tell people about their energy and their mind. And that is the power plant doesn't have energy. It generates energy. And in our own lives, we don't have energy. It doesn't just sit around. We generate it. And as soon as we go from that, oh, I'm supposed to have it, but I don't, to I generate it, that's the moment when you know people's lives change forever. Because it's like, oh, I don't have, ha I don't have happiness. I'm not happy. No, you don't have happiness. You generate it. Love you, it. Don't, you don't have confidence. You generate confidence. And when you know that, suddenly everything shifts. And I think it's really important for people. So we tell them in, in the, and that was actually what was going off, by the way, on my phone. Yeah. Uh, when we, when we yeah, started. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have this buzzer that goes off on my phone every three hours and says, what shall I be focusing on right now? And a lot of time I'll be doing that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I just spent 20 minutes focusing on something that's totally irrelevant. Yeah. Knock that off. That's distraction. Focus again. Choose where my focus goes. And that's how I've been able to grow so fast. I love it. So, um, Brendan, first of all, you've shared so much today. I just want to, first of all, I feel so inspired. I always feel inspired whenever I read your stuff or, you know, I get an email or I look at a video, but this Thank has you. been incredible. And one of the things that we love to do on Marie TV is we love to challenge our readers, right? Because we want mm -hmm. everyone to take action. So I think a really cool way to wrap up um, this incredible interview, why don't we challenge everyone in the audience, everyone who's listening and watching right now to take on this challenge. What do we say? Like, what do you think about seven days? Do you think the seven-day time frame is enough to see some awareness and shifts? Totally, yeah. I mean, I, I think people, if they, if they integrate what we talked here, yep. they can have the shift. I mean, people have a shift. It's not about the number of days. It's about how intense they get into the feeling and the emotion. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So let's, we'll give them some specifics just so they can have a container. So we're going to challenge you guys for the next seven days to set an alarm on your phone with every three hours with the note that pops up, where shall I focus my thoughts right now? And just have, just take a look at how that dramatically shifts your life. I'm actually going to do it the moment we get off the phone and I'm so excited. And uh, You're going to be so surprised. You're going to be like, oh my God, why do I have a bag of potato chips in the <laughs> show? You'd be totally surprised where your mind goes if you just let it go there right. without directing it to you know, important and meaningful ends in your life. Awesome. Awesome. I love this. So I know below this video, we're going to put some links. So um, Brendan is amazing. Obviously, if you Google him, you will find him all over the place, but we'll tell you exactly where you can get the book and other cool things. Brendan is one of the best, most generous people I've ever met in the world at giving away incredible free training. Obviously, he has incredible paid trainings, all of which I highly, highly recommend. Um, he's just fantastic. Brendan, is there anything that you want to share uh, before we officially wrap up? Yeah, I'll issue one more challenge that they can engage in and share beneath the video as well that I like to do with, the, with this book specifically. And yeah. that our drive for challenge 
is so important in our lives. And a lot of folks right now, they, they don't have a significant challenge out there. They're setting, they might have daily, like daily goals yep. and those are important, but goals are like a stepping ladder towards a bigger challenge. And so I'd say, you know, if you want to relight your life right now, give yourself a meaningful challenge that does stretch you. It's not a smart goal. Smart goal being specific and measurable and attainable and realistic. I think those don't have done more harm than good for people. <laughs> you know what it's taught? You know what it's done, Marie? It's taught the world to play small. It's taught the world to be more realistic. And I don't think that right now we need the dreamers and the activators and the people who are going to challenge themselves and push themselves so hard to contribute and make a difference. It's going to inspire everybody. And I say, you know, to, I have a big is, you know, I go off in the book a little bit about smart goals because it's inspired an entire culture of spreadsheets and vision statements that inspire no heart and no drive and no courage. And so I challenge people watching this, what is a significant challenge you're going to set for yourself that is a little bold, that is a little scary, that is an ambition that's meaningful to you? Not just about, you know, well, I'm, I'm, today I'm going to do this, but like, where are you going? What, what's a challenge that's going to drive you to do something inspiring? Like right now, Marie is building Marie TV and it's engaging. It's a hard challenge. She's not sure exactly how to do it. Right? It's like it's this creative, amazing thing, and she's so smart with all this, but she knows she's engaged by it because it's a challenge. It's bigger and it's meaningful to her, and she knows she can make a major difference with millions of people's lives. That's a challenge. So, what's your challenge? Post that below, and I hope you all interact with that because just setting that, setting that challenge for yourself again will light your life on fire. I love it. I love this so much. And I know you guys can't see me because I'm frozen in a weird place. But if you could see me, you know I would be dancing my little buns off because I absolutely <laughs> adore Brennan. Everything you shared, everything that you shared today is just, it's that gold and that wisdom for life that I know people are going to love. And so as always, the Thank best you. stuff, no matter where you're seeing this episode, the best things that always happen after the episode at marieforleo.com under the comments. So make sure you tell us. Tell us about your challenge, where you're going to stretch yourself, how you're going to make an impact, and make it big. Make it scary. Make it so exciting that you want to go after it and dig into it with your heart and soul because you want to make a difference in the world. If you like this episode of Marie TV, like it and share it with your friends. Brendan, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, thank you everyone for watching us. And we'll see you next time on Marie TV. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Hey, RHH Live is coming up. Are you coming? Go to rhhlive.com for details. You're watching Marie TV. The place to be if you want a business and life you love. Any questions? Just kidding. <laughs>